Welcome to the InFocus podcast with Insights. I'm Nicole Crick, and today I'm joined by Andrew Daru. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much for making the time to come sit with us today. Sure. And um, before we start with the podcast, I maybe just want to hand over to you to uh, introduce yourself. Cool. Yeah. So uh, I've been qualified since 1997, uh, started my career at Old Mutual, where I worked for 22 years, uh, left there in 2015. My last role there was at iWise, and since then I've done a variety of things, some time at uh, Momentum, the other smaller companies. I spent three years working for a mental health startup called The Space Between Us, and recently I joined a, a tech company that's developing technology in the health sector, so that's quite exciting to get into a new space. Uh, until the end of last year, I, I was on the council of, of the Actual Society, so that was a very interesting experience and I'm a uh, director for a couple of, of companies. So what a interesting and, uh, and varied portfolio of things that I'm doing. I uh, recently moved back to Cape Town from Joburg, uh, oh. getting used to being back in the mother city. Being back, yeah, back to the, the, the heat and the, <laughs> the, the rain, the wind, the well. wind rain, everything <laughs> around us. Um, okay. Well, I'm so glad to, to have you with, especially with your diverse background. So I was hoping that on today's podcast, we could talk a bit about all the wider things that actuaries could be involved in. I think normally when everyone, anyone thinks of actuaries, especially life actuarial, it's just working for a life company, but there's so much more value that we can have and areas that we should actually be contributing to. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned, I think, which is still then definitely within the actuarial sphere, but you mentioned your time on the council that came to an end last year. And I want, um, I think that's a, a very important area that actually should be getting involved in um, within the profession. Do you maybe you can share some some of your thoughts and insights or reflections on your time on council? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, Bim Else, who's not with us anymore, unfortunately, was uh, for a long time asking me to uh, come on to council and I was quite reluctant. And in the end, when, when Desani was president, I thought that was a good time for me to, to join and just sort of be part of that journey. And I must say, I I... I both enjoyed and found it more meaningful than I expected. Ended up being the first two years with the years of COVID. Uh, and that was just fascinating to have to deal with and, and look at things from that perspective. So you, you almost get to contribute and, and, and engage with things at a national level, at a bigger picture level than our day jobs normally allow. I was involved in the Public Interest Governance Committee where we give oversight to public interest actuary and to sit there with people like Desmond Smith, uh, Peter Doyle, uh, Peter Withy, real stalwarts of, of the profession with so many years of experience and to, to hear them debate at a national level what we should do, what the role is that the actuaries can play. It's fascinating. So I learned, I learned so much and just about how the profession works. Uh, there's a lot of things uh, happening in the profession that honestly, after many years uh, as a member, I wasn't aware of. So I find it I find it very meaningful. In the end, we're a member organization. So if the members don't do something, it's not gonna not gonna get, get done. done. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. And and are you still involved on the public interest side? I am. So uh, I'll I'll keep on uh, working with Gasani on the public interest side. I think that problem statement of how do we as actuaries use our skills to really impact the country at a policy level um, and and specifically not from the perspective of the companies that employ most of us. And it's not to say that the employers of actuaries are not also contributing, most of them are, yeah. but to specifically ask ourselves the question, how can we just find what Lissani calls the big, hairy problems that we can contribute on, whether that's quantifying the numbers around national health or employment growth or uh, the, the medical negligence that we've been working on. Uh, there's just a lot of things. And with the research committee that's got a lot more focus in the last few years, uh, and so there's actually funding available that can help really do the work so that when we go out and talk about things, it's informed and it's grounded in, in research, I think there's, it's very, very exciting to, to uh, you know, make that part of what, what the actual brand stands for in the country. That's great. That's great to hear. And it's great to hear that yeah, people, I'm hoping that more people are also getting involved. I guess it is, it is, would be quite a challenge to separate 
I guess you're saying yourself from your company, but yeah, so driving the yeah in the end driving forward the, the actual real society in, in that way as well. Yeah, I think that is an important point you make. You obviously need to talk to your employer about what the parameters are. Sometimes uh, what you say out in public, you can't sort of say, "Well, I'm switching off that employed part of me. This is now the other part of me." So you have to just make sure that your your employer understands that. But there are also a lot of actuaries doing consulting. And, and with more of an open mandate to, to choose where they get involved. And I, I've seen already, and I think there's going to be more of that, where people actually almost find a new career, a new niche for themselves when they get stuck into an area of work where it isn't just one yeah. problem to be solved, but it leads to another question, another question, uh, and actually turn that, uh, as I said, into a, a new wave that they can serve for their career. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Okay. Um. Then I also just, as part of that, I also different nature also mentioned you're a, a director for a couple of uh, for a number of different companies. Yeah. Um, what would your ad, I guess your advice be to individuals who would also want to pursue that that pursue being an, a non executive director of yeah. companies and and the the process going around yeah. developing and growing into those types of roles? Yeah, that's a good question, and and I think. There's some, there's some work required on both the, call it the demand and the supply side. So we need to do more to get ourselves ready to play that role. But it is also on the company side, it's a lot easier to always just pick the people who already have experience and sort of just choose the same pool. My, for me, the, the, the first building block is, is a really passionate belief that our skill set is incredibly valuable outside of what you would call traditional actuarial area. When people see a CA qualification on a CV, then then there's a, a well-established premise and belief that you're getting more than just an auditor with that qualification. And I don't think there are enough people in senior positions, whether that's public or non-public sector, who have that same awareness and understanding of what the actuarial skill set brings. So, so that's one of the, the things that, that we're working on and that I think we need to do more. But basically what I'm saying is being an actuary, even if it's in a non-actuarial company, makes me a better non-exec director because of our ability to really look at the big picture, to understand all of the different factors that weigh into a complex environment, think through the interactions between them, deal with uncertainty. These are all building blocks of our qualification that are critical to being a non-exec director. You you have these sort of snapshots that you get of what's going into a company. You're not there day to day. You've sort of got to infer into the pages of the pack that you that you get. And to sift through that and really see what the important things are is uh, I found extremely valuable, even even where it's not actual. Where I started is is uh, a non-profit company actually. So I work with a company called Sentry, uh, who involved in financial access uh, and, and that kind of work. And by just getting to know Dubell, who is the is the MD, he invited me to come onto the board there. And that was my first experience. And, and after that, I could kind of say to other companies, well, I have some experience. So I think that is a challenge, is, is, is where does one start? Uh, I think there's quite a lot of startups and non-profits, those would be the ones, you're not going to start with a listed company. So, so to start with either a friend who's got a startup and he just needs two or three directors or a, a non-profit or a trustee of, of even things like the school governing board, those give you the experience. And then the other thing that I did is I took the exams of the Institute of Directors and those are extremely valuable. Uh, they're really quality facilitators. It's very meaningful the time that I, that I spent there. So I'm now a certified director, which is sort of the second from top qualification the IOD offers. And I'm in the process of applying to become a charter director, which is sort of once you've certified and you've got a certain amount of experience, you can uh, you can sort of apply for that. And there's only about 150 of those in the country. So I think that's still a, a valuable sort of piece of paper that you can also put in front of companies. And then it's it is really something where the more you do it, the better you get. It's a skill. It's a muscle that you have yeah, to develop. develop. Um, 
So um, I'm privileged to be chairing the NetBank insurance business now. And that's been another sort of step where you not just rocking up for the meetings, but uh, working with a team to set the agenda. And as much as there is this, uh, a certain amount of governance and compliance and red type that is part of the job, I love that ability to impact the big picture and the strategy of the company with actually quite small chunks of time involvement, uh, which you don't really get uh, with other roles where you need to sort of be there yep, uh, for, for many more hours. So uh, it really appeals to my yeah desire or, or enjoyment of of uh, strategy of big picture and, and of guiding a company it's a serious accountability it's not something that one takes lightly but for me it's it's a it's a nice part of my my portfolio no, like, really interesting. It was really, thank you for it was a shame insights on how to you know how to potentially go about that i think one of the things you you've mentioned previously not not to me as well that you also did a cal uh, um coaching Okay. But would it would it also help be helpful for someone who would want to go into that direct direction of non executive direction to also get them to potentially reach out to get a coach to actually help them and kind of help them develop a path forward of what they what they should be doing? Yeah. That's a it's a good point. I think in my career the conversations that I've had and the relationships that I've had with yes, people who are older than me, but also with peers have been a big part of how I've done my research, explored new things and, and, and had people around me to support me when I'm sort of needing some advice, needing some sounding board. Um, so absolutely, I think uh, to have a network of people, wherever you go in your career, you meet a new bunch of people um, and, and to keep those relationships going gives you that, that sort of crowd behind you uh, that you can tap into and uh, yeah the bunch of of people who were sort of a generation ahead of me at Old Mutual that I still meet with for coffee every quarter or so um, and yeah just tap into into their wisdom and it means that when you're making decisions there, there's there are people who've been around the block and yeah I'm getting to, to the point in my career now where I can also start playing that role to to the next crowd so that's kind of i think how the community keeps on keeps on going yeah and i think that's that's also a really nice way to also i guess also segue into some of the work that you've done on uh, working with a company who was looking at mental health and well-being because having also having that type of support network around you would also obviously help not feel isolated um and also be more part of your community um and improve your your make your health and your mental health and well-being. Yeah. What were the your perspectives from working with a company that kind of had that focus on? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one because Linda Mtenjani, the the founder and uh, and still owner of of the space between us, was a colleague of mine at Momentum. Uh, she was the HR exec, so so that was just a relationship that then worked out that when I became available from a previous job, she needed somebody with those skills, and we sort of started working together. And I became a partner, and so it's sort of the relationship point again. Um, I learned so much, Nicole, about mental health in that time. It, it was we literally started the business a couple of months after COVID arrived, so June 2020. And I think that COVID, in many ways, sort of yanked the fig leaf away uh, about mental health. It's always been there, but we've we've tried to not talk about it and hide it and, and sort of below the surface. It's still a problem that we're not talking about it enough, but I think there's much more of a realization and, and it's become a bigger problem. I'm not sure that we've even dealt with all of us what the pandemic and the lockdown and the disruption and the people that we've lost and so on has done to all of us. So uh, such a critical building block yeah. to the way that you see yourself in the world and the skills that you have have a meaningful life and the uh, and career. So as I said, I, I was kind of doing the boring stuff so that Linda as a clinical psychologist could do the magic, but just to be in that environment and, uh, yeah, understanding the importance and the skills that one can put in, in your life, which can really help you and make you more, more effective. And it's not just about 
surviving the wheels coming off in your life. I think there's a real element of of operating at your best. Yeah. So not just being your sort of neutral self, but you can really if you if you take the time to manage yourself and you get to know this machine called Andrew and how do I get the best out of it? you can really make yourself more effective. So there's real upside uh, in, in having this conversation. Uh, but we need to be a little bit courageous and, and actually go in there. Yeah, I was like, I think it was, it was, I think it was just after, uh, just after COVID started as well, I listened to a podcast where they also mentioned there's a difference between thriving and just kind of surviving exactly. and you need to find your flow and your rhythm and, yeah, and people. Exactly. And yeah, as you said, potentially that's one of the, the it's hope one of the positives that we can take out of COVID as well as trying improving, not being scared of those discussions around mental health. Yeah. And, 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 and that was a big part of what really we were trying to do and what Linda is still doing is just to create the spaces where these conversations can happen. Yes, you learn content, but in some ways, the moment you start engaging with it, it sort of takes the mystery and the threatening nature of of these things away and you actually realize this is something that has value and if you can then embark on that journey where you just like you make managing your financial health and managing your physical health part of your routine it's something that you make sure there's always a, a certain amount of time set aside for I think mental health deserves the same kind of uh, yeah space and capacity in our lives but, and so it's really great to hear that there are companies now focusing on that and trying to actually help people get yeah. get that get more of that balance and also taking time for it as well because if you yeah you know, if you hide it away it's not something that that's ever actually going to go away and will impact you yeah. going forward yeah yeah great and um yeah then i, I guess on your your latest venture that you're involved in um stone street maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, yeah what what they do and, and your role within the company as a and actually, I guess coming into more of a, a, a what do you call it, a IT space or very different you know, company. Very different yeah. company. So Stone Three has been around for about twenty years. They uh, started as more of a consulting company, but uh, have also been sort of building more for themselves. Uh, so basically, I think you'd call them a tech company. So deep domain knowledge in the mining industry and so on, and they help companies to implement new solutions. Um, provide services to monitor and support that, and then use the data that's generated from that to really make it better. The easiest example is, is improving the efficiency of mining processes by having, for example, cameras that can observe the bubbles on top of these solutions when they're trying to extract the ore. Uh, and then with AI and, and lots of data points, uh, help companies to get an extra half or 1% out of, uh, out of that, that process, which makes a big difference. So they started a health business about five years ago. And that business has been doing fairly well, but uh, in the mining industry, when when the, the the cycle changes, then then budgets get pulled for things like the the, the health of employees. Unfortunately, yeah. so it's not really got to profitability in the way that they were hoping. So there's a strong technical team of of a, a doctor and a few engineers and, and IT people, and so I'm coming in with a more of a business experience. Uh, and, and sort of strategy and really turning what's technically exciting into, uh, from a financial perspective, a profitable business. So I'm really not bringing a, an actuarial skill set per se. Um, I'm bringing my business experience uh, and adding that to, to the technical team. Um, and yeah, if all goes well, then that unit we will uh, spin out of the of the big group and raise external funds and, and really turn it into a company in, in its own right so very exciting it's it's for me nice to go into a brand new technical domain where i need to learn and in ai and and that sort of space i think it's an important area for mm -hmm. me to upskill myself but i also don't need to become the expert because there's plenty of expertise in the team so that sort of complementarity of, of me bringing what I've got to complement the skills that are already there. Kind of how I like to to look at, at business relationships. I don't need to be the cleverest person in the room to to be a leader. Uh, being being a leader in an environment and, and helping to set that strategy is is a skill in itself, which is often what I what I feel that I that I bring. Yeah, I think that's that's also a very 
who actually is also getting involved in wider fields. I think that's a that's also a, a nice thing to remember that you you don't have to be the smartest or the brightest person in the room, but it's bringing your little bringing your as you mentioned the, like the what we learn as actually that our way of thinking mm -hmm. to a broader audience and uh, yeah allowing kind of a allowing other people to be the brightest in the room but just supporting them and, and bringing that together which we sometimes like think we we kind of forget <laughs> it's actually such a hard thing when when our qualification and our exams and everything is about coming up with the right answer and we sort of build our pride on i've found the right answer and therefore if i can find the right answer faster than someone else that makes me a more valuable human being and i had to learn that uh, the hard way that sometimes actually taking a whole team with you towards an end is so much more valuable i did a coaching qualification through uct last year and and the distinction that they draw between being a mentor and being a coach is that a mentor brings their own experience into the conversation. So I've got some ideas and solutions on how to solve your problem. The coach in terms of their model doesn't bring their contribution at all. They're really playing the role of a, of a mirror or a sounding board or a facilitator for the coachee to do the work and to have to figure things out for themselves. And, and, and for me, that was challenging is to learn yeah, how to <laughs> shut up and listen, but such a valuable insight because if you if you never learn that skill you don't see the value of it because you're constantly thinking okay I, I, absolutely my intent is to help this person I, that's really what i'm trying to do but i'm doing it from the perspective of which of my experiences which of my lessons which of my ideas can i give whereas if i say that's not allowed then really my question is what's going on with nicole why why is she suddenly start getting nervous when she talks about that or um, I wonder why that thing impacted her so much let's ask her to talk a bit more about that so it's 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 really playing that role of helping the other person to figure things out for themselves so I think there's there's a role for all of these different modes so I see that as adding another string to my to my bow and yeah excited to also just on a on a sort of on, on the side basis start uh, coaching a bit more i think in in 10 or 15 years time that's going to be quite a big part of my portfolio and i i love that i love sort of journeying with uh, with other people and uh yeah getting a bit more value for the lessons that i learned <laughs> yes. and the bumps and the bruises <laughs> that i have hopefully they can uh, they can be beneficial to others thank you thank you so much for joining us as well i think podcasts like this just discussing broader fields and additional things people can do um in there with the actuarial qualifications i also think it's it's such a valuable thing um when i started i actually we just thought actuaries worked for live companies and now we're actually realizing there's so much more out there and we need to we need to make sure we do additional things and take additional courses and mm. and also find things that we finding areas that we really enjoy to work work in um that we can bring our actual actuarial knowledge to the forefront as well so yeah thank you so much for yeah, it's a great story. pleasure and i've enjoyed i've enjoyed talking to you my path is very non-standard so i'm not sure i advise that everybody try to follow but i think to to um to consider the possibility of really asking yourself what resonates with me what yeah. would i like to do um and and then my strong belief that our skills actually help us in in many areas uh and so with a little bit of of courage uh, maybe there's some other doors that we can that we can open thank you so much yeah, thank you